Even for COVID-19 challenged couples, crime doesn't pay, literally. The months and months of COVID-19 togetherness has been challenging for many couples. As, reported, as we reported back in the beginning of the pandemic, there has been a reported upsurge in divorce applications in China, as well as apparently increase in incidences of infidelity elsewhere. In a lighthearted digression from the usual family law topics, this week we will cover a question that may have fleeting and only theoretically crossed people's minds in these relationship times. As a beneficiary under his or her life insurance policy, would you still get a payout if you caused your spouse's death? The answer under Canadian law, perhaps unsurprisingly, is a firm no. Under what is known more colloquially as the Slayer Rule, this legal concept precludes a person who causes the death of another person and who is also a beneficiary under that person's life insurance policy from profiting from that crime by receiving the insurance proceeds. This principle was confirmed a long time ago by the Supreme Court of Canada in a case called Hall v. Herbert and considered by the courts many times since then in various contexts. One of them is seen in a recent insurance claim case. The insurer Viva had set up an investigation of auto collision industry, prompted by suspicions of fraudulent activity. Aviva bought and intentionally damaged two vehicles, had independent appraisers assess the damage, then took them, took them to randomly chosen body shop, which happened to be owned by a man named Warda. The cars were equipped with hidden video recording devices. Warda and his employees, unaware that prior appraisals had been done. Through this test, Aviva confirmed that Warda employees had added unneeded parts and unnecessary repairs to the written appraisals submitted back to Aviva and other insurers. Aviva also sued Warda directly for various fraud-based claims, including making repairs that were not necessary, deliberately and fraudulently damaging vehicles so that they would need repairs and staging motor vehicle accidents. Among other things, Aviva sought punitive damage from Warda to the tune of $100,000, as well as investigative costs of $200,000. Warda by, responded by claiming that in light of Aviva's own alleged criminal mischief in setting up this test, he had no right to sue them. In other words, he raised this concept stemming from Aviva's surreptitious and deceit in orchestrating the investigation against Warda and other body shop owners in the first place. Against this backdrop, the court explained this concept of this way of ex turpa causa. The primary issue raised by Warda defendants is the doctrine of ex turpa causa. Under this tort doctrine, the party cannot rely on its own wrongdoing to ground a claim. Justice McLaughlin, as she then was, described the origin of this doctrine in the Supreme Court's leading decision of Hall versus Herbert the decision we discussed just recently. The power expressed under this doctrine finds its roots in the insistence that the courts, that the judicial process not be used for abusive illegal purposes. The use of this doctrine to prevent abuse and misuse of judicial process is well established in contract law and insurance law, where it provokes little controversy with that said, there are new nuances in the terms of how this doctrine is used. At least one important distinction should be drawn. The doctrine prevents a person from profiting on the basis of illegal or moral conduct, but does not prevent the person from being compensated for loss in the circumstances where he or she otherwise be entitled to it. This was seen in the Hall case where the Supreme Court of Canada considered the scenario where a man had a car accident while in the midst of committing a criminal offense and suffered head, head injuries. The court concluded that this doctrine did not operate to preclude him as the injured party from going after compensatory damages relating to these injuries, even though he had sustained them while engaged in a crime. Please give this video a thumbs up, comment below and share it with your friends and family.
subscribe to stay up to date with, with, in family law issues and future videos. We'll have upcoming videos such as the topics of a day in the life of a family lawyer and other Q&A videos as well. You can submit your questions to us via social media and be sure to hit the bell icon to be notified when we post these new videos. Thank you for watching today. Until next time, I'm Russell Alexander.